Hi, you guys. I have CPK. I have not eaten CPK. I don't even remember the last time I ate it. It had to be when I was little. Mm, I got a margarita pizza. I'm the kind of girl that likes a simple slice of pizza. This is delicious. Mm. I also asked you guys on my Instagram what I should get. Somebody said the spinach artichoke dip. Let's try it. Oh my God. Mm. Look at that deliciousness. That is so, so good. Where am I gonna put this pizza? I don't mind holding it. Mm. Okay, no, I'm gonna put the pizza down. <laughs> so today I thought I would do a little true crime mukbang for you guys. The sun is out to play. Mm. I watched a documentary last night called The Witness. Um, it's about Kitty Genovese. I'm sure you all know the story. It was like one of the most famous murders ever. Like I remember learning about it in school, like in a sociology class or something. And I'll explain why it was brought up in a sociology class. Mm. Also excuse the mess my apartment is in. I'm in the middle of packing for Thailand. I leave tomorrow. Hey, hey, hey. I'm trying to compress everything into one backpack. So hopefully that works out okay. Mm. So Kitty Genovese moved out of her home into a New York City apartment living in Queens. One day she went to work, was driving home as she normally does at 3 a.m. She worked at a bar. While she was walking to her apartment building, a man stabs her and she lets out these blood curling screams, begging for help. People from the apartment building across from the street can hear the screams and they look out their window and they don't do anything. From what the New York Times reported, they said that 38 witnesses saw Kitty Genovese being murdered and didn't do anything. So plagued with this, Kitty Genovese's brother sets out to find out more information what actually happened to her 50 years later. He was always really close with Kitty out of all of his siblings. So I think he kind of wanted some form of closure on what happened to Kitty exactly. Did 38 people really see her being murdered and not say anything? I'm sure you guys remember learning about this in school. I think it was a sociology class or something, but it was like the whole lesson, like. If you saw somebody being murdered, what would you do? Would you call the police? Personally, I would. Like, there were a lot of people that only heard her scream and didn't see anything. But if, even if I heard somebody yell, like, help me, help me, I'm, I've been stabbed, I would call the police. But then you think, well, what if they were just scared that they were gonna get murdered next, you know? Even though in an apartment building, he probably wouldn't have found them and killed them. But if you see somebody being murdered, your instincts for survival might kick in and you might want to preserve your own life, not do anything. So when I learned about that case, I was like, 
I don't totally blame like anyone for not jumping in and doing something, but they could have at least called the police. So that's what everyone thought. Everyone thought that 38 people watched this girl being murdered and didn't do anything. But that is not actually what happened. And I didn't realize that until I watched this documentary. And neither did Kitty Genovese's brother. So he tries to interview all the 38 witnesses. A lot of them are dead. Most of them are dead actually, and others just don't want to comment on it. In the documentary, he finds out that 38 people did not watch his sister being killed. 38 people might have heard screams, but they didn't actually see it. And it really goes into how the New York Times reported it. And the reason why they didn't tell the truth is because it would have ruined the story, they said. Which is so dumb. Just comes to show that the media can really twist anything to make for a good story. Mmm. This pizza is good. And I'm from New Jersey. Okay, we. I want to try the egg rolls. Because Will was like, the egg rolls from CBK are amazing. All this was expensive as hell. I did get it delivered. I was shocked. I was like, where is a CPK in the DC area? I didn't even know. Mm. Oh my God. I love spinach artichoke dip. Mm -hmm. So I think that egg rolls have like chicken, bacon, avocado. It kind of reminds me of the Cheesecake Factory ones. I'm dipping it in this sauce. I don't know what sauce it is. Mmm. That's actually really good. I think I might like it better than the Cheesecake Factory ones. Mmm. That's good, there's bacon in there. Mm, mm, mm. Should we try it with the ranch? I'm really trying not to spill on my carpet. <laughs> Those are crispy and delicious. Mmm. I'm gonna get some water. Normally, I don't drink water while I eat. I finish eating and then I chug water but i read somewhere that if you drink water while you're eating it helps you digest it better oh that is so good okay where was i oh yeah the media so the media really can just change it up to make for an interesting story for example they also mentioned that kitty died alone So for all these years, Kitty's family thought she died alone when that's not what happened. Apparently Kitty's friend who lives in that building was with her when she died. The New York Times wanted to make it as dramatic as possible, but how could you do that to her family just for a good story? Like that's messed up. And the family, they kind of, after it happened, just shut it out. They never wanted to think about it. They never wanted to talk about it. Um, especially back then, because this happened in, I think, the 1960s or the 1950s. I don't think, like, processing emotions was 
that popular back then or like talking to a therapist, you know, you kind of just locked your feelings away. So they never wanted to think about it or talk about it. So they read the New York Times article and they just assumed that's what happened when that's not what happened. So this is how it played out. Kitty parked her car in a parking lot around 3 a.m. She was walking to her building. A man stabs her. She starts screaming out, help me, help me, help me, I'm being stabbed. Somebody does yell out in the apartment building across from her, hey, get out of there. The man hears them, gets scared, he runs away. Kitty like drags herself to her apartment building, goes inside and like, 20 minutes later, the killer comes back while he's finishing the job because he found out she was still alive. Somebody opens the door and sees what's going on, closes the door. Turns out that guy actually called Kitty's friend and was like, hey, Kitty's bleeding out. She's being stabbed. What should we do? So he, people blamed him for not like interfering in that moment, but I'm like, how can you blame somebody for that? Like the guy is right there with a knife. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to put yourself in those shoes because you're not actually there. It's really sad because while she was being stabbed again in her apartment building, she called out to this guy because she knows that he lives upstairs and he didn't do anything he didn't except call her friend. By the time her friend got there, she was like already dying. But her friend was with her when she died. And the New York Times just didn't say that. What would you guys do? Like if you were, the, his name is Carl Ross, the guy that she called out for. If you opened your door to somebody you knew in your apartment building being murdered, would you physically try to interfere? What would you do? Cause like at that point, he's he's got a knife, you know? He could come at you and then two people being stabbed doesn't really solve the issue. If it was my friend, somebody that I love, say no more. I would be down there beating his ass. If it was somebody I didn't really know. Honestly, who know, who's to say and who's Who's to know? I at least would call the cops. Apparently Kitty's brother, when he was investigating, he spoke to a few witnesses and they were like, no, we called the cops. Like they heard what was happening, saw her hunched over and they called the cops. So then Kitty's brother, his name is Billy. Billy went to the police station and apparently there were no logged calls from that night. So are the witnesses lying or did the police just forget to log the call? Which very much could have happened. I feel like with sudden murders like this, especially if it's somebody that you're close with, you want every answer in the book. And that's just not what's gonna happen, you know? Like I felt really bad for Kitty's brother because Nobody really knows what happened that night. You know, he can talk to all the witnesses in the world and he still doesn't have that like closure. I don't talk about this ever um, publicly, but I had a friend that was murdered like a few years ago. Um, I still don't know what happened to him. And it, I think about it every single day, you know? But it's almost like you have to accept that you really will never know because you weren't there, you know? That's crazy to think about. It does upset me, you know? I, I don't know what happened. Oh, it was so sudden. I know he was killed. And it just makes you think like, did he die alone? Was he in pain? Did anybody hear anything? You just, Think about all these things and it does not help. Even potentially finding the answers or what thinks would give you closure doesn't. For example, in this documentary, 
um, Kitty's brother Billy actually wants to speak to Winston, the guy that murdered his sister. So Winston refused to speak to him, but then he sent him a letter, basically just saying that it wasn't actually him that killed Kitty that night and that it was like a mobster that killed her. And this guy's like, we know it was you because this guy, Winston, has reports of killing other women. He didn't even get caught for killing Kitty. He got caught for killing other people. So, I don't know, dude. But Billy really wanted to forgive him. And he's like, I feel like if I talk to Kitty's killer, I could try to forgive him more. I was like, you don't need to forgive him. He killed your sister. I don't forgive the guy that killed my friend. Like, you don't have to forgive. I think that you can have inner peace without that forgiveness. Maybe that's just me, I don't know. Once he got that letter from Winston, he was expecting, you know, some kind of clarity. He was expecting Winston to admit what he did and Winston just fabricated a whole other lie. So it didn't even help him in the end. I think that you get your own closure by yourself. You give yourself your own closure. Nobody else can give that to you. Or you might never get closure, you know? And it's kind of crazy. Like murders and cold blood like that. That just like, it's traumatic. You never stop. Like the family was like, Billy, you need to get over this. And I'm like, are you kidding me? He doesn't need to get over anything. It's his sister. Like, what? It's also interesting when you think about the media and the role that they played in this whole case. Like there was such an intense investigation because of the media. And you see that in so many other cases like Gabby Petito. Meanwhile, there are a lot of cases and a lot of people that get killed that never get reported because the case isn't interesting enough. It kind of reminded me of a, I don't know if you guys have ever seen The Wire. It's basically a cop show that takes place in Baltimore. And in the last season, the police department wasn't getting enough funding. And the head detective was like, okay, maybe if I fabricate a serial killer, then they'll start to report about this and then they'll fund the police department to have us investigate it more. So that's what he did. He pretended to be a serial killer and he fabricated all these like murders. And the Washington Post was like, oh, we, we want in on this. We're gonna report about this. Meanwhile, there's so many other murders that happened in Baltimore, babe. It's crazy. I mean, for the longest time when I heard the Kitty Genovese story, I was under the impression that so many people were like in front of her watching her die. I didn't realize that it was at 3 a.m. and people were in bed. I thought it was like midday, she was stabbed around a ton of people and they didn't do anything. That's like the story I remember. I was like, oh my God, like I have no faith in humanity. Nobody helped her. But half the witnesses like only heard a scream and didn't see anything. So you just don't know. You just don't know. And apparently Kitty Genovese was gay. I was like, hey, okay, Kitty. Queen. Mm. This is so good. Yeah, Billy just has a lot of strength. I don't know how he does it. Like, even when he was meeting with the killer's son, the killer's son was being like kind of rude. He was like, are you in the Genovese crime family? Like, I thought I was gonna get murdered upon coming here. It's like, babe, your dad literally like brutally murdered this man's sister. 
how are you saying this right now? And he was like defending his dad. Babe, I don't know, like if my dad killed somebody and I was meeting the person's brother, I'd be like, I'm so sorry, my dad is a horrible person. Meanwhile, the brother was like, he keeps getting denied for parole. Like, can you do something about it? No. Billy held it together so well. I guess I'm just not, maybe I'm not that peaceful of a person because I, I would not be able to forgive that easily. Will was like, what should we eat for dinner tonight? And I was like, babe, there's gonna be so many leftovers. I didn't realize that they were gonna like, it's the portions are so big. It's kind of like Cheesecake Factory. Uh. So yeah, that's pretty much the story of Kitty Genevieve's. I just wanted to talk to you guys about it because all those little details that we all thought wasn't the truth. Half of what the New York Times said in that in their article about it wasn't true. And it made me have like more faith in humanity. And I think that was something that Billy liked to learn. Like he was like really disturbed because he's like, did all these people see my sister getting murdered and not say anything? But that's not necessarily the case. That makes me pose the question to you guys. What would you do if you heard something? I hear sirens right now. Like, well, okay, they're probably all already on their way to something, but <laughs> you know, there are times where I hear people screaming outside of my apartment. You just never know what it is. But who knows, like it could be a murder. As for the people that saw it and didn't do anything, shame on you, babe. At least call the cops. At least call the cops. I feel like because everybody always thinks, oh, somebody else will do it. You know, somebody else will, will call the cops or this doesn't have to be me. But like, if you see something, say something. That's what you should take out from this mukbang. Okay, there are a lot of sirens, but welcome to DC. <laughs> so tomorrow I leave at seven in the morning to go to New York. And then I'm meeting up with, you guys know Alex. Well, I'm going to Thailand with his sister, Madeline. Madeline is such a planner. Every We have a whole itinerary set out. She's amazing. She gave me packing tips. So she lives in New York and the flights out of JFK were just cheaper. So I'm going to New York. I'm gonna stay with her during the day. And then we're going to Thailand at like 10 PM at night. And she had a good idea. She was like, what I always do for these long, long flights, because it's an eight hour flight to Helsinki and then an 11 hour flight to Bangkok. And she says that we need to act like we're in Thailand the second we get on the plane. <laughs> so maybe I'll try to sleep like during the day before our flight. I also didn't realize that Thailand was a full 11 hours ahead behind. Like, wow. Thank you for watching this mukbang. I'm going to save all of this for tonight. And yeah, I'll see you next time. Oh, also, I think I'm gonna film like a Thailand vlog. Let me know if you wanna see that. Okay, bye.